Hello everybody and welcome to a, actually this is a review, I'll call it review module, um, module 7. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, I hope you had a, a great weekend. I want to show you some actual photos from the field. I'm going to be doing more talking than writing. As you can see, there's a monitor behind me instead of a whiteboard. So it's going to be up to you to, uh, to take notes, actively listen and watch the video in its entirety okay so here we go um there is some new stuff and there's a lot of review so tune in ready so um one of the couple of things we're going to be talking about is cleaning cooking separating chilling which we've talked about before the safety zone the big one um your hands right being the number one culprit so right now we've been working on food safety knowledge the food safety practices Obviously, some of you can't do it because you don't, you're, not, you're not employed, you're not in the field, but by watching your parents cooking, or maybe if you've already been doing some cooking on your own, supervised cooking, um, you're able to start putting those practices to work, and that's what's going to help make it stick, all right? And then, obviously, everything is about attitude, so food safety attitude is what we've got and remember you're a food safety manager this is the serve safe food manager certification so you need to role model everything that you do because people are looking up to you all right so the the public health is in your hands a quick reminder 100 degrees or as hot as you can tolerate it for your hands always soap and water and we're going to get more into detail about that as we move along into the uh, the presentation now, one thing we haven't had a chance to cover yet is a three-compartment sink. And each sink, it, not, not every, every establishment has a label on it, so you need to memorize it anyway for the exam. But the first sink is wash, rinse, and then sanitize. And I'm going to throw some numbers at you now um, because they're going to be repeated anyway. So if we were not using detergents, the first sink, the temperature would be 110 degrees. There is no value for the middle sink. The final sink, if we were going to be using hot water sanitizing, hot water sanitizing happens when the temperature is at 171 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if you're going to do hot water sanitizing, you do need gloves that are going to be able to tolerate those extreme temperatures. Otherwise, you're going to be burned. Um, do most people hot water sanitize? No. Is it on the test? Probably. Is it good to know? Definitely, <laughs> right? So this is where we are. But now here's the thing with the three compartment sink. It actually has five steps. Because the three compartment sink, the first step is scrape. And now if you go back, you've got wash, rinse, sanitize, right? So scrape, wash, rinse, sanitize, and the final step is air dry. So let's say I throw a question at you and I say in a three compartment sink, what is the third step? The answer would be sanitize. But if I say in the five step dishwashing process, what is the third step? The third step is rinse. You, you follow me? So five step dishwashing process or five step process for cleaning is scrape, wash, rinse, sanitize, air dry. Now that also is going to be identical if I'm taking care of cleaning a table. I'll scrape, wash, rinse, sanitize, air dry. All right. Uh, so again, let's say I ask you for the second step in a three compartment sink. The second step for a three compartment sink is rinse. The second step of a five compartment sink is wash. So be mindful of the question. Be mindful of what you're being asked to answer. All right. A uh, couple of things. So here's an actual three compartment sink. A couple of things are wrong here. They have things air drying in the beginning. The air drying should be occurring over here. Now you'll notice that this three compartment sink has no labels. Now depending on the health department, the health inspector that comes in, some of them are going to require that those sinks be labeled and in a couple of minutes you're going to see why. Um, and then there should always be a hand washing station nearby. Hand washing station needs hot and cold running water 
it needs signage, employee must wash hands. So if you've gone out to eat, you've already seen at restrooms, employees must wash hands. It's not that they have disgusting employees, it's mandatory, it's required by law that those hand washing signs are anywhere that there is a hand washing station. Whether it's for employees or not, they're mandatory by the state of Florida. Uh, then over here, we're going to talk about this a little more in, de in detail later, but what's happening here, and it's difficult to see it, there's an air gap here, but there's actually also an air gap here. So the air gap happens where the faucet ends and the sink begins. In this case, the air gap happens where the drain ends and the other drain begins. So an air gap simply means a space of air between two sources of water. All right. Um, over here on this floor right here on the corner, there's a little a little dip, a little ramp that is called coving. C O V I N G. Coving. So the purpose for coving is to make the floors easier to clean. So as you're mopping or sweeping, what's going to happen there is that dirt won't jam up if it's a fixed corner. So the coving gives a gentle a uh, slope to make it easier to clean. All right, um, my mouse stopped working. Oh, here we go. So this is a picture. It's it's a little fuzzy, and I apologize. But what this particular restaurant was doing was that they had chicken directly below the wash sink, the wash compartment. So if they went there to do any kind of dish washing, there was a huge risk of cross contamination with the poultry there. Then. In this same restaurant, they had meat that they were cooling off sitting on this milk crate just off from the floor. Again, a big no-no. Now, what this picture doesn't show, and I regret I didn't take a better picture, is that over here, there is a mop sink. So a mop sink is also referred to as a utility sink. So that's where you are going to wash a mop or dump mop water. Okay, now, again, so if this is the mop sink or the utility sink, Here's a cross-contamination hazard, right? That beef is at risk of being cross-contaminated. This is obviously a box of plantains. Now what's taking place here is that they're using it also for storage of a cleaning brush. Um, this is a container of beans. Now they don't technically need a new lid, but what they could have done here, and, and I did recommend it while I was there, was to put some form of tape uh, molding so that it would seal the box so that you don't allow for dust or rodents or any kind of debris to potentially fa fall into that uh, container of beans. The other thing that it needs is a label that reads beans. So regardless of what is in the container, you always have to have a label of what is in that container. Uh, here, this is their back door. So what this photo is showing is a gap. There shouldn't be a gap. So here they needed uh, a grommet or a rubber to seal it because what happens here is that you run the risk of pests, roaches, bugs, insects, etc. getting into the restaurant. And what you're going to see back here is that this is where they keep the trash. Okay, so again, so now we're raising the likelihood of a pest infestation because we've got this gap in the door and we've, we're also having a problem with the garbage outside of that door. And there it is, you also see it at the bottom. So now the health inspector will, they, on average this restaurant used to come in at around 42 to 52 violations every single inspection. So the owner called me up and said, what can you do to help? My ladies work really hard. They just don't know food safety. They don't know what they're what to look for. And he said, as an owner, I don't even know. He was he's monolingual Spanish, and the report was all in English. So I went in there. I didn't have to look at much of the report to find the violations, but when I went in there, I, I found the violations by the naked eye, and then I went through the report to help him out with the others. Uh, everybody has a job, yes, but we can also help everybody else. So here's what's happening. This was out of soap and this was out of paper. So you're training to be a food manager. You need to own every aspect of that responsibility. 
Um, if it is somebody's job, then find out why it didn't get done. Don't go jumping on somebody's back. Your people skills are going to be tremendous. But if you've got that moment, if you, you happen to take the last towel or you walked in and it was the last towel, change it. Change it now. Because what you don't want is an employee or a customer drawing their hands on their shirt or on their pants. It looks bad for business and it's bad for the health of your customers. So keep an eye on supplies. Mop bucket. So mop water goes where? In the utility sink. I know at home you don't have a utility sink. This isn't a home test. But we don't want to dump mop water in the toilet because when we do that, we actually are cross-contaminating backwards. Most people think it's the mop bucket contaminating the toilet, but it's actually the toilet potentially contaminating the mop and the mop bucket because remember, we go number two in here, which means we poop. So if somebody had diarrhea or, or not, whatever it is, um, when it's coming in contact here, you have a chance of cross-contaminating the other way around. So mop water goes in a utility sink. The other thing they were doing was that they were dumping it outside in the back. You don't do that either. All right. Um, so here, this was interesting. So she is using the first compartment sink to do the washing. And she's got gloves, which is completely useless because even at 110 degrees, you're not going to get burned. But here's what I found interesting while I stayed there. She still had the gloves on, turns around to take care of food that is cooking on the other side and then <laughs> ready and then with the same pair of gloves goes to clean the chicken and where is she cleaning the chicken in the third compartment sink where you sanitize so it was one problem after another um, so huge huge no-nos um, so wash, rinse, sanitize, gloves, when you change tasks, wash your hands, change your gloves. I know, I worked, I worked in the industry, your hands are going to become dry and they're going to hurt. Okay, but use hand lotion that is food safe, at least, or at least use hand lotion at home. When you're gone for the day, buy yourself the very best hand lotion that you can. You're going to, your hands are going to peel and hurt in the beginning. Um, you will get better. This table, he didn't know why he was getting a violation for that table. It has to be food grade or restaurant grade equipment, right? So the problem with this wood table is that it works as a sponge. It absorbs bacteria and microorganisms. It needs to be stainless steel, right? So um, as soon as I got in there, I'm like, there's nothing we can do about that table except to throw it away, all right? So we threw the table away. Um, I, I got him a, a stainless steel table at a, at a, whatchamacallit, at a, at a yard sale. Somebody had a restaurant great table for like 12 bucks. I picked it up and I brought it over to him. All right. So no, no wood, no wooden tables, not in the kitchen. Here, problem with the milk. Problem was that it was in the summer and it was about 97 degrees when I got there at around 7.30 or 8 in the morning. I was there a couple of hours, so if it's 97 degrees out there, and this was a very small restaurant kitchen, the temperature was coming close to about 107 degrees. Okay, that's how hot it got in that little kitchen. So as soon as you use something, immediately put it away. All right, so use the milk, pour it, and then put it back in the refrigerator. There's a ton of cross-contamination going on here as well, too, by the way. Same thing here. So this was um, a batter that was made to cover this. So this had eggs and milk. Now they prepared the batter and they shifted to another task. That's fine. Shift to another task, but put that in the refrigerator or finish this task and fry it. Be mindful of that clock, especially when the kitchen is, is going at around 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Room temperature is 70 and we can leave hot food out without temperature control for four hours. Cold food, if you remember, is six hours. At 107 degrees, all those numbers go out the window. 
There, there's no truth to those anymore. All right. This box grabbed my attention. I get there, and um, by the way, also that little wooden stool, garbage. It went away. They were getting, they were losing points for that little wooden stool too. But anyway, I walked up to the box. I'm like, what is that? So I touched the box, and it's cold. So when I got up close to it, what this says is that it's smoked cheese. So they receive smoked cheese frozen, right? And then they sell it um, by the block, right? So they'll put it into smaller portions and they sell it for a couple of bucks. Problem is that they were thawing the cheese at room temperature. And as I just said, it wasn't at room temperature because it's about 107 degrees in that kitchen. So by the time that that block of cheese thaws out, the outside is all gooey and nasty and funky in order for the middle to be nice and soft. So I'm going to show you, there's four ways to correctly thaw food. Leaving stuff on your counter or in the sink or running it under hot water are all no-nos. All right. I talked about this, I don't recall which module, but I know I mentioned it to you. Um, so that lamp, there was a low ceiling in the bathroom. I'm pretty tall. I'm, I'm coming in at around 5'11". If I whack that lamp, I run the risk of getting cut. That's in the bathroom. Now, if that same light was outside in the food prep area, now you have a physical contamination because the glass falls in. Not to mention the potential for a good jolt because, yeah, it has a, a, a cover, but that cover is glass. Below that is the light bulb. So if it's low enough and I make contact with the light bulb, I could get a good jolt out of that light bulb, the electricity uh, going through my body. So that needed a metal housing or contractual work to make a hole and put recessed lighting so that now it's not in the way at all. Again, so this is another container of food. It's missing what? What does that container need? It needs a label, right? It needed a label. So they were losing points for a bunch of little things. This got me because, see if you can spot what's wrong with it. And I don't know if you can see it there. Um, let me see if I can zoom it in a little bit. No. Oh, yeah, it does zoom. Perfect. So she's got in, in that hand, on that hand, she's wearing a glove, right? Let me see if I can fix it again. She's wearing a glove. And she pretty much kept that glove for the duration of my visit. I wasn't there to reprimand or correct. I was simply there. My first visit was observational. That was it. When I went back, I presented everything to them. And they are hardworking ladies. Trust me. I mean, they are hardworking. They simply didn't know the rules for food safety. Okay. Um, then the other thing is the, uh, the apron. It's a garbage bag. I, I exp expressed to the owner that they actually needed an apron that could be washed or a disposable apron, but that would cover them better. Um, she doesn't have a hairnet. Her hair is just in a bunch, so she needed a hairnet. There's that brush we were talking about earlier. Uh, and then the kitchen is tiny. So what I expressed to the owner is you're always going to get violations because it's an old restaurant with a very tiny kitchen. So you're going to get, we broke it out, so we, he ended up by between 12 and 15 violations a month, um, which is actually great because we went from 42 to 52 violations a month. Now what was left over was because they couldn't fit the, um, the schematics of the restaurant the way the health department requires it, but they take that into consideration. There was no risk for foodborne illness at that point. The violations were beyond the scope of foodborne illness. So it was actually safe. Okay. So here's that garbage. Remember I was showing you that, that back door and the, the space of light under here and over here. And there was the milk crate. So here's where they were putting their garbage before my visit. So they would accumulate the garbage on, in, a, in, a gar in a shopping cart. Obviously, the shopping cart was not going to see the supermarket anymore. But they would put it in there because it was a plaza and the 
garbage dumpster was about six doors down. So it was a pretty long walk for these ladies to walk with multiple bags of garbage. Um, so that's okay. I said, listen, you don't have to get rid of the shopping cart, but what you're going to need to do is put two or three plastic containers out there so that as the garbage is taken out of the restaurant, it goes into those plastic containers. Remember, pla uh, your garbage containers cannot have leaks. Okay, so if they're leaking, they're going to get hit you over the head for that on a, on a health inspection. Now here, there was no garbage can at all. So they obviously took a good whack for a violation. Okay, the, the problems just keep on going. This is to wash poultry, but it caught my eye, right? Because I walked over to it um, and, and it had some gooey stuff on it. So what I realized is that they were washing the poultry and then rinsing out that container and then hanging it there to dry. What's the problem with rinsing it? They were cleaning it, not sanitizing it, right? It needed to be washed, rinsed, and sanitized. And they weren't doing that. They were just washing it or cleaning it, right? So if you remember the earlier modules, we clean the floor. We won't sanitize the floor because I'm not going to eat off of the floor. But this needed to have been sanitized. So it was just being cleaned. And as it's dripping dry, it was dripping over these bottles of lemon juice. Um, so when you go to handle any of this, now you've got chicken juice, right? So chicken juice is what? It's good chances are that it's contaminated with salmonella, right? Uh, poultry. I'm, I'm sorry. So here's the beef. If you remember beef, uh, one of the big contaminants for beef is E. coli. Um, again, the beef was just sitting out there in this hot kitchen. Nobody was paying attention to it. If you already prepped it and it was ready for something later, you take it, you cover it with a cellophane or a saran wrap or a plastic wrap, whatever you want to call it, put a lid on it, and then put it in the refrigerator. Now, when it goes in the refrigerator, and we're going to cover that later, it needs to go in a very specific order. You can't just throw it in the refrigerator. You're not home anymore. Okay? We're not in Kansas anymore, Dorothy. Phone usage. Right? Where's my phone? It's over here. Health department inspectors have a big problem with that, and so do I. Most of us do not wash, rinse, or sanitize our phones, right? You're not, most people don't sanitize their phones. And then the other person, you have cross-contamination from my dirty hands when I got to work. Now, every time I go to touch that phone and I'm working on something else, there's cross-contamination, and I move it, and I put it here, put it there. So that's a big no-no. Keep your phone in your locker. Keep it out of the kitchen. Okay, if your restaurant, if you're the restaurant owner or your boss says it's okay, then listen, you work it out. But for, for the sake of food safety, no. Keep the phone out while you're at work. Uh, one of my students moved to Connecticut about three years ago. He just sent me a picture, got a job. He's working as a dishwasher at, a, at an Italian restaurant in Connecticut. And they don't even allow the phone during dishwashing. Because remember, yeah, the dishes came in dirty, but they're not going to stay dirty. You're going to wash, rinse, and sanitize the dishes. So if now he handles the phone and then handles a sanitized dish, everything got undone. Okay, um, so we've, we covered foodborne illness, cross-contamination, and types of contamination. I've got a few more minutes I wanted to talk about what we had talked about once upon a time also, biological contamination chemical contamination and physical contamination. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I am, I am purposefully repeating things because I want you to realize that you're, you have a 90 question multiple choice exam on ServeSafe. There is going to be a lot of redundancy. So please um, I understand that I am intentionally repeating because it's going, you're going to see the question, you may see the same question many times repeated. And if you got it wrong once, and let's say hypothetically is there eight times, and you got it wrong once, you're going to get it wrong seven more times. All right, so I'm going to, I'm going to put a pause on it right there. Thank you. Uh, stay tuned because we're going to continue from this next time. I need to do reviews. And then we're going to go back to the e-study guide so that you have more of that. Um, you know,
know what? Let's do one more slide because you were asking for. You said, come on, one more slide, Mr. Pooch. We got it in us. All right. So remember, this is the list provided by whom? This is by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control. Right? And we talked about it on that pyramid that I drew once upon a time. So these are the most, this, this is what the CDC identifies as the causes for food contamination. Poor personal hygiene, cleaning and sanitizing. I just talked a lot about that. Time and temperature control. We've covered that. Approved sources and suppliers, we've covered that too. And food allergens, so that's where I'll leave it. All right, so be blessed. Jump on Canvas, uh, multiple choice quiz to test your knowledge. You're gonna do great. Please, 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 please continue watching these videos in their entirety. Go back and re-watch them too. All right, be blessed, have a great week. Love you, bye.